Welcome to Bioenergetics of Exercise and Training. Now if you've done this properly, you actually read the chapter handout prior to this, so we can uh, reinforce that information that we find in the text with having seen it once, and then we're going to be talking about it a little bit more here. So the slides will be going automatically, but you can hit, uh, you can hit pause whenever you so desire to and take a moment to reflect on the information, look it back up in the, in the handout, um, or jot some notes down. Okay, these next couple slides we're going to look at some terminology. First is, is the definition of bioenergetics, which is the flow of energy in a biological system concerned with the conversion of food to usable energy sources. Do you remember your energy yielding nutrients, right? So those are things that we take in through food that we consume, digest and absorb that we can store in the body and then later uh, be converted into the usable energy which we'll talk a lot about is ATP or adenosine triphosphate. Yes, carbohydrates, fats, and proteins. Remember those are also classes of essential nutrients, however not everything that we take in is capable of uh, generating energy. So ways that we generate energy, mechanical, chemical, electrical, and thermal, we actually do those all in the, in the human body. So when it comes to human movement, um, that's essentially going to be a form of mechanical energy, and we'll see that uh, abiding by laws of physics, there's going to be a conversion because initially we will start with chemical energy that's going to allow for the muscle contraction, uh, thereby allowing movement of the skeletal structures, therefore mechanical energy. When muscles contract, we actually we increase heat, uh, therefore we're also going to be producing thermal energy, which incidentally is uh, the number one loss or uh, lack of efficiency in the system is because of the amount of energy that we lose as a result of heat. So metabolism is a very common term and essentially most people think of it as just the the energy expenditure which in fact is is true. There are two types of reactions um, that take place exergonic and endergonic. Exergonic reactions are going to release energy and endergonic are reactions that are going to absorb energy for their chemical reaction. So catabolism is going to be the building, or excuse me, catabolism is the breaking down of products and anabolism, or anabolics is what a lot of people think of it as, is where we put um, things together. So where we actually form ATP will be um, anabolic and the breakdown of ATP will be catabolic. As I mentioned earlier, chemical energy is adenosine triphosphate, diphosphate, or monophosphate is where that comes from. So this is just a, uh, a picture of uh, chemical structures. So essentially they're all tight phosphate bonds, and when those phosphate bonds are, are released, there's going to be the release of energy. So we refer to these as, as potential energy structures. So ATP, which stands for adenosine triphosphate, meaning three phosphates, those three phosphate bonds are attached um, very, very tightly. Therefore, when we break one of those bonds, sort of like releasing a spring that is compressed, and when we cut one of those bonds, it releases energy. Okay, so this is the chemical energy that we're going to be using predominantly in the, uh, in the body. And then we also have ADP and AMP, which are... Um, double and single versions. Typically we take the ADPs and the AMPs to restore and produce ATPs. So these biological energy systems, they're usually broken down into two different categories, anaerobic and aerobic. Anaerobic means without oxygen, aerobic means with oxygen. So we'll see that uh, these systems are going to be used to provide for the amount of ATP required or muscle contraction, as well as other things that are going to take place in the body that require a form of chemical energy. 
So energy stored in the chemical bonds of adenosine triphosphate is used to power muscular activity. The replenishment of ATP in human skeletal muscle is accomplished by three basic energy systems, phosphogen, glycolytic, and oxidative. So essentially what that's telling us is that the foodstuffs that we take in, we're actually going to be using that food to create these uh, chemical bonds, these adenosine triphosphates. We'll see that some of these are actually stored within the body, the muscle itself, and then when we deplete it, because we're using the ATP that's already stored for muscle contraction as well as producing it for muscle contraction, these three systems are always going to be working together. We'll see, however, that one of them will predominate based on the need for ATP, which is really going to be the intensity of muscle contraction. So the phosphogen system, it's anaerobic, meaning that it does not require oxygen. So when you look at the um, chemical formula for this, that it does not require oxygen to produce ATP. Uh, it provides ATP for very short term. It's going to be stored in the muscle itself. Uh, so it's used for immediate and high intensity activity. So again, immediate or high intensity activity. So getting up out of a chair, for example, is going to be something immediate, although not intense. Because as we'll see, is these other systems are going to lag in their ability to produce ATP for muscle contraction. So if we waited for the aerobic systems, it would take you much longer to get out of your chair once class is over. So this is the actual chemical process. When we look at ATP, we need to have an enzyme. So enzymes drive our chemical reactions. Without them, uh, the chemical reaction would not take place. So in this case, myosin ATPase must be present to break down ATP. So the release of this enzyme is going to be stimulated by uh, the need for muscle contraction. We will break down ATP, break off that phosphate group, and when that phosphate group is broken, thereby giving us the release of energy that takes place in the muscle to provide for muscle contraction. Then we reconstitute it. So in this phosphogen system, we take a creatine phosphate and essentially pop off the phosphate, add it back to an ADP, thereby giving us the ATP and the creatine is left over. So creatine phosphate is also something that we find directly stored in the muscle that we actually take. And another reaction that takes place called a myokinase reaction. This is where we're going to take two groups of ADP in the presence of myokinase, another enzyme, um, and essentially we'll be splitting one of those to add the phosphate group to create one molecule of ATP plus one molecule of AMP. So it's actually simple addition and subtraction uh, looking at, at the mathematics. The the creatine kinase reaction is especially more important because the body won't want to just simply drop another phosphate group from an ADP because potentially we could create that into an ATP. So we'll see that ATP, that's the key factor, that's the, that's the big boy that we want in the muscle. So any opportunity we can make more ATP and less ADPs and AMPs, the better off we're going to be. So we control this system through uh, the need for ATP. So there needs to be some sort of stimulus that requires the need for more ATP. During muscle contraction, if we are breaking down ATPs into ADPs, that higher level of ADP is going to stimulate that chemical reaction, the creatine kinase reaction. So as we start depleting ATP, because you're getting up out of the chair, you start walking we're going to stimulate a chemical reaction to restore so it's almost as though there's a there's a set point so we're never going to want to go below a certain level of ATP and therefore we're going to stimulate the, the production of it once we get to the normal levels that actually will in, inhibit more production of ATP so in other words we don't overdo it so high levels of ATP inhibit and stop the reactions